for. Oh my god. Okay, let's talk about the collective that action problem here. Um, okay, that's not visible on the video. So I'm going to move the collective action problem over here. What is a collective action problem? A collective action problem is a problem where um, the interests of the individual are irreconcilable with the interests of the community. Or at least initially they appear to be irreconcilable. In other words, it is in the interest of the individual to do one thing, and it is in the interest of the community to do another. Ah, so China versus America. Something like that. Individualism versus communism. <laughs> Something like that. But let me describe what I mean here. Okay. Um, some months ago, I remember this distinctly. It was kind of burned in my mind because I thought, that's a collective action problem. I was stopped at a stoplight, and the dude in front of me, I saw him like load up his McDonald's bag with all his junk, and then he rolls down the window and just like throws the bag out the window. Okay? And like the trash disperses all over the media. This is, I was at the stoplight and I was absolutely livid. Okay, so I'm I'm you know like I'm gonna go out there and make a citizen's arrest. I'm gonna go up and headbutt him. Right? And my wife's sitting there beside me, and she says, no, no, you are not. He is bigger than you are, he is stronger than you are, and he will take you in a fight. Okay? And so I didn't actually get up and go do that. Okay? You did or did not? I did not. I did oh. not. <laughs> but if you think about it, everybody agrees that it was bad for him to do. Okay? I mean, we all agree that we would prefer to have a community that's clean, a community without trash all over the place. It is in the interests of the collective, the community, that something take place, namely that there be a clean community. However, it is not in the interest of the individual to contribute to a clean community. If you think about it, it is actually in the interest of the individual to defect and do precisely the opposite. In his particular case, um, I guess it was too hard for him to keep the trash in his car until he found a trash can and disposed of it there. I mean, heck, that could take 30 seconds to walk to a trash can. That's a lot of life. Okay, but at any rate, all right, it was in his interest, it was more convenient, more flexible, more convenient, just roll down the window and toss the trash out. You can see this phenomenon on display all around Houston. If you look at public intersections, public parks, public land of any kind, it's always trashed. Whereas private land, private enterprise, private corporate parks, private retail establishments, they are clean because management makes those low-level employees go out front and pick up the trash at the end of the workday or else. Okay, it's in the interest of the private property owners to have clean establishments. And it's in the interest of the community to have clean public parks, but it is not in the interest of each individual citizen to contribute to those clean public parks. And this is precisely the, act, the collective action problem that exists when it comes to sweat, the sweatshop system. Okay, pretty much everybody agrees that it's bad that we have this reemergence of sweatshops. Pretty much everybody agrees that like it's not good for the world to have the rich and the powerful employing the poor and the vulnerable, the marginal laborers in developing countries and paying them pennies. It is in the interest of the community that we not have the system. However, it is in the interest of each individual to do precisely the opposite, or each individual business, as the case may be. It is in the interest of Nike to maximize its own margins, even if that means doing something that's not in the interest of the collective. For this reason, it's really, really hard to stamp out the sweatshop system is really hard to stamp out because the individual interest here is very strong. If you don't negotiate those workers in China down to the least possible wages, then others will. And they're going to beat you with lower prices on the uh, shelves of the stores for the American consumer. 
So the individuals all have very strong self-interests, individual businesses all have very strong self-interests to do otherwise than what they might agree would be uh, a good thing for the community. Okay, um, there are ways to solve collection, collective action problems. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those ways to solve collective action problems when uh, we get to the topic of bribery um, because that's also a collective action problem. Uh, but for now, all, the point I just wanted to make is that the sweatshop system is very entrenched because it is in the interests of individual businesses to defect from what everyone agrees would be best for the global community. End of story. Any questions or comments about that, Nate, that part of the... Uh, yeah, it's in the interest of each individual business, if it can, to defect from the collective um, consensus about what's best for the global community. In other words, it's in the interest of each individual business to run sweatshops, even if it's not in the interest of the global community that sweatshops be run. Um, it's in the interests of the MNC, I used the example, when you watch the Tuesday lecture, I used the example of a, a laborer in Shenzhen in China. It's in the interests of um, Western MNC to abuse that laborer in China as much as possible, even if it's not in the interests of the global collective that that laborer in China be abused. Let's look at a case study here. Um, Nike has kind of been the poster child for um, supply chain uh, ethical challenges, we'll call it. But I want to say on their behalf here at the outset that they have cleaned themselves up a lot. Things have gotten a lot better than they used to be. This is a very uh, famous company. Nike was founded by University of Oregon track athlete Phil Knight and his coach Bill Bowerman in 1964. Bowerman made shoe sales out of his automobile at track meets. So they observed that uh, flat shoes had difficulty gripping the pavement on um, co uh, college tracks. So they innovated and decided that better would be to have some sort of spiky shoes. Okay, but early primitive spikes were not available. What they did is they made shoes with waffle irons. It's kind of a legendary founding. They made shoes with waffle irons and uh, athletes had better grip as a result. Knight and Bowerman devised the Nike name and trademark swoosh in 1971. Headquarters are still in Beaverton, Oregon. This is a company that comes out of Oregon. Uh, the swoosh is one of the most famous, most iconic corporate symbols around the world. Nike's mission to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. They are a multinational corporation and one of the world's largest suppliers of athletic shoes, apparel, and sports equipment. Nike itself is relatively small. They employ fewer than 50,000 workers. However, they also contract with businesses that are not Nike around the world. And in those contracted businesses, they employ nearly a million laborers. So that is a very large operation. Why is Nike successful? This, this has been an incredibly successful apparel company. They appeal to young shoppers who are more focused on health and wellness. Their shoes are stylish and comfortable. Probably a lot of us are wearing Nike right now, yes? Some of us? Bands. Bands? Fair enough. So um, Nike has become so uh, ubiquitous here in America that it's now no longer like a trendy thing in a lot of circles. It's actually trendy to do something else besides Nike uh, among some. Uh, although Nike like, is still, certain kinds of Nike products are still seen as luxury items. Uh, I was reading a news article the other day about two guys in Chicago and one shot the other over uh, his Air Jordans. He, it was like there was a dispute over who had sold who the Air Jordans, right, and like how much, and like he just shot and killed him for Air Jordans. Okay. All right. Uh, demand for athletic apparel is trending upwards globally. That's continuing to be the case. Okay, Nike's manufacturing map is very large. All over the world, they employ contract laborers. You can't see these um, numbers down here, but I'll read them for you. Contract factories, Nike's contract factory is 612. Workers, 820,000. These are, again, not Nike workers per se. They are workers for contract factories. Okay, Nike doesn't 
They want to be able to tell American investors and capital providers that they treat their laborers fairly, which they do. Um, so they outsource the, um, the, the contract work to other companies. Uh, manufacturing companies, 46. They are especially concentrated in their operations here in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Vietnam, China, India, those kinds of countries. Nike's marketing strategy relies on sponsorships. This is a legendary company. This company innovated incredibly in marketing when they came up with this. These guys founded the celebrity athlete sponsorship model. These guys came up with that. Nike pays top athletes to use their product and promote and advertise technology and design. Okay, MJ is the most iconic uh, spokesperson for Nike. I think back in the day, in his heyday, he was making over a billion a year from his Nike contract. He's probably not making as much now. Uh, 60 plus past, present NBA players, Serena Williams, Tiger Woods, he was just in a car accident, so we'll see uh, if he can play again. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what his status is. Um, who are some of the athletes? That, I think Rory McIlroy is Nike. Who's that? He's a golfer. Yes. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Kevin Durant is Nike, right? He's Nike. Michael Phelps. Phelps is Nike? Okay. Um, who's Harden? Is Harden? Harden's Adidas, right? He's with Adidas, I think. Is Curry? Who's, with, who's Curry with? I think he's with Under Armour. Okay, so Nike, but Nike has a lot of them. Okay, Nike is the brand of all NFL jerseys. They also sponsor countless U.S. colleges. Uh, but not HBU. We um, signed a deal with Under Armour uh, recently. Nice. So, we are. <laughs> That's why we're always under. So, wait, we, we get the oh. oh. Dude. <laughs> hey, we... We oh. nearly beat Texas Tech in the fall. That's like, near, we nearly were nearly. over. Nearly. <laughs> yeah, we were somehow D1. So how that works is I don't know. they pay us to wear their apparel? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, probably not very much. I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating here. Or it might just be that. If we were at the University of Texas at Austin, it would be very good for them to pay us because they would want to be associated with our brand. But since we're not a very reputable... But, like, it's HBU Athletics, so... <laughs> um, okay. What, what's your sport, man? Soccer. Soccer? Yeah. Okay. Soccer. Good. Yeah, man, soccer doesn't count as like one of the big sports in college anyway. So you don't, you're you're like immune. You don't have to worry about it. I didn't say that. It's like it's basically it's like football. It's football and men's basketball, and then like everybody else is down here. Like I did track and cross country in college, and we like distributed flyers. Come to our meets. Come watch us. And nobody came. Like nobody gave a rip about track or cross country where I went to school. I think so. you just watch a bunch. Yeah, I mean, okay, fair like, enough. Yeah. When you're doing football, there's like ramming, there's like hitting each other, all that stuff. Like, like, watch people like dying in cross yeah. country. Like, like they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's I the same reason why the normal people watch football. <laughs> well, I think people prefer to watch coordinated fighting, so they watch football this instead. This is why hockey's popular. This is why NASCAR is popular. Like, oh, yeah, people, people go to watch the crashes, popular. man. They yeah, go to yeah, watch like, the crashes you know, and the fights. Left for like 500 laps, but sometimes you get more views than a bunch of other sports. Hey, when people started spiking people in races, like, things got dirty sometimes. Mm. Yeah, but we were the Christians, so we never spiked anyone. Okay, um, Nike has recently expanded its presence in emerging markets, such as <laughs> China, India, and Brazil. Okay, uh, these regions have had higher growth rates than developed markets for the past few years. Um, Nike's a really prestigious brand in the developing world still. It's kind of satur reached saturation here in the United States, so you know it's not as prestigious anymore. But if you have Nikes and you live in Bolivia or you live in Kenya or something like that, then um, I mean you're somebody. Like that gives you status, and it identifies with American athletes. Uh, that happens as well. <laughs> Nike's weaknesses. Um, <laughs> they rely almost exclusively on footwear sales, so that's a problem. 
Due to its strong brand, Nike charges a premium on its products, which in turn supports higher margins and profitability. Their stuff almost never goes on sale. I don't know that it ever does. Uh, they regularly charge a lot more than other footwear companies for what's basically the same product. The cost of its footwear is higher than most of its competitors. That makes its product out of reach for many customers around the globe, etc. Okay, let's talk about the ethics here. Nike is a poster child for bad treatment of suppliers. Uh, consider its shoe plants in Vietnam, which are notorious for unsafe conditions and underpaid workers. So this is a particular case that I uh, researched on the net. Okay? Plant workers at this particular location have been found to be exposed to carcinogens that exceeded legal standards by 177 times in parts of the plant. Let that sink in for just a second. Like, that's crazy. This is not American legal standards. This is Vietnamese legal standards. 177 times. Here's another st crazy stat. This is about this particular plant. 77% of the plant's employees suffered from respiratory problems. So if you work there, four out of five is the chance that you'll suffer from respiratory problems. And employees are forced to work 65 hours a week, more than Vietnamese law allows, and excessive heat, noise, and foul air for $10 a week. Okay, so that's about 65 cents an hour. Uh, workers with skin or breathing problems in this particular location that I was researching, I just like found this easily in one like Google search. <clears throat> We're not transferred to departments free of chemicals. More than half the workers who dealt with dangerous chemicals did not wear protective masks or gloves. Workers were not informed about these dangerous chemicals. Arsinogen, toluene was found in the air. Okay, uh, Nike has also been dinged for employing underage workers, like in Cambodia and Pakistan. It has claimed this was accidental. Again, Nike does not themselves under, uh, employ the underage workers. They contract with local companies that employ the underage workers. Hence, Nike can claim it was accidental because they did not themselves do it. Um, now, I want to say on Nike's behalf, they have improved working conditions a lot over the past 20 years. Um, they, they kind of became notorious for this in the 90s and early 2000s. And so everybody started pointing fingers right at them and saying that they're the, one of the worst culprits here. So they started cleaning up their act. Unfortunately, many of its factories in developing countries still do not meet Nike's own ethical standards. How have they been cleaning up their act? Well, there have been some improvements. Here's the CEO, Phil Knight. Here are his six policies for improving working conditions in Nike supplier factories. All Nike shoe factories, he says, have to meet the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration's standards in indoor air quality. He has pledged to raise the minimum age for Nike factory workers to 18 for footwear factories and 16 for apparel factories. Um, I think this is Nike will include, I think that's what I meant to put there, uh, non-government organizations in its factory monitoring, uh, expansion of its worker education program, also expansion of its micro-enterprise loan program to benefit families in developing countries. Nike Gives Back includes things like Special Olympics partnerships, active school programs promoting the benefits of sport, exercise, and a healthy lifestyle, Nike School Innovation to increase the number of students who graduate on time. This is a really big initiative, the Girl Effect that they're doing, support for adolescent girls. Um, They've mainly been criticized for, I mean, basically targeting and abusing adolescent girl workers. So they're, they're uh, trying to clean up their image by doing uh, heavy support for adolescent girl education and uh, opportunity expansion. Okay. Yeah, so that's what we got. Um, questions or comments about the Nike case? Reflections, thoughts? Neat? Okay. Neat? Still going to buy Nikes? Still going to buy Nikes? I, at this point, would feel comfortable, I think, buying Nikes. I believe I would. It's just business. Um, because they have cleaned up their act a lot, so it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Uh, I would definitely not have felt comfortable buying Nikes 20 years ago, but I think things are a lot better now. It would be nice if I were, if I were told the history of the product. You know, if there were like a little tag, this work, this shoe was made by worker, um, you know, Annalise in Indonesia or something. That would be great, but I'm not, so I have to sort of rely on hearsay. Yes. Speaking of history, would you 
buy a Volkswagen? Would I buy a Volkswagen? Um, yes. 